Assalamualaikum and a very good evening everyone. Um, I guess we'll start the show then. Tu yang bahagia Datuk Profesor Adi Bakar Murzaman, President and Pro Vice Chancellor of Menaj University Malaysia and also 2022 Merdeka Award recipient, Mr Samuel Isaiah, Program Director from Pemimpin GSL as well as our recipient for Anugerah Harapan Merdeka in 2022, Puan Karina Fauzi, Secretary of Merdeka Award Trust, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera and welcome to the first edition of the Merdeka Award Talk Series for the year. Thank you. On behalf of the Trust, I would like to welcome you to the very first edition of the series. We are indeed very, very excited to have you all with us here today as we talk about a topic that is close to all of our hearts, education, and how we form a much more deeper understanding and knowledge on the topic and which is considered one of the most powerful tools we can use right now to change the world. Um, but before I go on about the talk series and our topic for today, I would like to introduce you to the Merdeka Award Trust itself. So the Merdeka Award actually is founded by Petronas and Shell in 2007 to reward outstanding individuals as well as organizations who've done tremendous work for the country. And together with it, we have our two main signature program, the first being the Merdeka Award itself and the Merdeka Award Grant for International Attachment. For information, both program is now uh, run biennially on alternate basis to give better focus to each program. So last year, we had the Merdeka Award and this year, the focus is all about our Merdeka Award Grant recipients. And just heads up, we will be announcing our grant recipients uh, uh, later on this month as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, just follow us on Merdeka Award socials to find out more information about that. All right, so getting, getting on to it, um, about Merdeka Award Trust, basically, the name Merdeka Award is used to basically commemorate the spirit of independence, which transcends beyond the, conven the conventional definition of, of Merdeka, basically. It explores with it the liberation of mind and spirit, the strength and character and in integrity, basically, and meaningful achievements and creativity and vision that enables greatness amongst us all. Um, Basically, for today's talk, for the first edition of the Merdeka Award Talk Series, it will be the first of many, and we are seeking to foster more intellectual discussions and promote knowledge sharing, sharing among all our esteemed individuals in their respective fields. And today, we are very much delighted to have with us our two panellists, Professor Datu Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman and Samuel Isaiah, our distinguished speakers for today. Before we start, please allow me to give a brief introduction about our panel for today. We have with us uh, Prof. Adiba, a world-renowned medical expert and advocate in the field of HIV and AIDS research. Prof. Adiba, she is, as I mentioned earlier, a recipient of the 2022 Mudeka Award in the Health Science and Technology category. And she has helped many organizations, including the International AIDS Society and the Global Commission on Drug Policy. She is now the President and Pro Vice Chancellor of Monash University Malaysia and the CEO of Monash University. And with her today is our second panel, which is uh, Mr. Samuel Isaiah. Can I have a round of applause, please? Or better known as Cik Gusam, who is the recipient of the first ever inaugural Anugrah Harapa Mudeka, which was introduced in 2022. Sam is a passionate teacher who was once the finalist for the 2019 Global Teacher Prize and he has been instrumental in affecting change among students and among the teachers in Malaysia. He is now working to equip more teachers, especially those in learning outcomes through Pemimpin GSL. All right, so now without further ado, please join me with a round of applause as we welcome our two speakers from today, <laughs> Professor Dr. Dr. Adiba and Samuel to stage. Take it away. Hi everyone, hello. Thank you for coming. It's good to see, um, you know, the room is full. Right, right. Uh, thank you so much to the Mudeka Awards, I think, for inviting me uh, to share today. I think it's an absolute honour, uh, not only to be seated next to Prof Adiba and to share in this panel, but to also give you some insights of the work that I've been doing and uh, perhaps what we should do together for the Malaysian education system. And likewise, although um, my, my Marika Award was for my work in health, but I guess I transcend health and education, and that's why the trustees, the, the secretariat, wanted me to share this podium with, with Sam to look at um, 
this important issue from a higher education perspective, whereas Sam will enrich you with his immense knowledge of uh, the, what we call K-12 education. So we, we're going to have like a chit chat. There's no moderator. So um, we're going to fire questions at each other and, and share our thoughts. Uh, like I said, for me, um, I'll, I'll uh, limit my, my thoughts to higher education. And, but Sam knows everything, so he's going to... I don't, to I don't. Go, <laughs> I think... Uh, <laughs> to go from uh, pre, preschool all right, the way to right. K-12 and, and right. higher education as well. Right. So over to you, Sam. Right, so Prof, uh, let's, let's do a bit of a uh, catch-up. The last I met you was last year at the Mdeka World Ceremony. What have you have been up to since? Mm, nothing much. <laughs> no, I, uh, I left public service, or rather I retired from public service um, because I have almost reached that ripe old age of 60 um, and re return in a way to my alma mater, uh, Monash University, as you heard, um, as the president and pro-vice chancellor. So overseeing Monash University Malaysia, um, which celebrated its 25th anniversary a few months ago. As for me, I think um, I'll probably take a bit longer to speak about this. I have my team here with me. We've got Cheryl, we've got Bernard. I don't see Bernard. We've got Constance as well. And the work that we do, um, this year is quite significant. We launched the first ever Malaysia Teacher Prize last year. Uh, we had 800 applications last year. And this year, we've got more than 2,000 applications, Prof. And the idea is to uplift the teaching profession. I think in a lot of work that we do in Pemimpin GSL is to put teachers at the epicenter of everything. It's going to be cliche, but I would really like to see this. say this, is that the quality of our education system cannot run far away from the quality of our teachers. But more importantly, the perception of community, of society, through the relevance of teachers and what they do in the classroom is equally important. Research has also shown that the more teachers are looked up in society, it directly contributes to student outcomes. Absolutely. So that's something that I'm doing right now, Prof. And uh, another thing that I'd like to talk about is the Orang Asli program that we are working on. So we are currently working with the 30 Orang Asli schools in the state of Para. It's been fantastic. But besides all these programs, I think this year, Prof, ever since um, the Merdeka Award Ceremony, What's most important for me uh, is the things that I've learned. And it's a lot of times it's remind this. And one of the key things that I've learned is to listen and to continually build trust. As we work on the ground, we work with marginalized communities, we work with school, we work with teachers. We, some of us, or even myself, sometimes we have a messiah complexity. To, to understand and to think that we know how to solve problems for these communities and for teachers. But I think my team members will tell you more stories about this. We sit with teachers, we go on boat rides together with them, we interact with community members. And that key thing that I've learned is to listen and to develop trust. It's always a reminder. And it's very valuable to spend more time to listen and to build these relationships instead of just going in gung-ho and just, I'm going to change everything, bang, 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 and all of that. Absolutely. Fantastic, Sam. I, I honestly can't do what you do. Um, and yeah, the focus on um, teachers, because, you know, just, just like in higher education, we spend a lot of time making sure that um, the academics are trained and, and that continuous training and, and learning is, is really important. Whether it, w it was during my time at UM, um, retraining the doctors who are not there essentially to teach, but you know, they, they're there to look after the million patients at PPUM, but part of their job is also to, to teach the future doctors. And so it may or may not come naturally for a lot of people. And so a, a lot of investment in teaching the doctors how to teach. Mm. Um, and of course, here at, uh, at, at Monash, it's also what we do. So that continuous learning um, is key, um, especially now that, you know, the world has changed so much, we, we're going digital, and once again, um, you know, it doesn't come naturally to people, and, and you've got to, to keep showing them the way. Um, and so investment in teacher training, in mm -hmm. time, like what you've done, investment in, in resource and money is, is key to ensuring a, a, you know, a, a world-class um, education system. And if I can say, Prof, I think another key thing that I've learned this year is the value of partnerships of not working in silos. Um, and uh, 
we at Pemimpin, I think we are very grateful that this year is quite significant for us as we have fostered partnership with the Ministry of Education better than ever. I think they are more open to speak, they are more open to discuss, they are more open to share things with us. Um, it wasn't that way a few years ago, but right now I think it's fantastic because I believe that for the work that we are doing, it's not about creating a parallel system. It's not about, I'm doing something that's better than you. I'm doing teacher professional development way better than the Ministry of Education. It's not about that. Because if we are at, we, we, if there is a parallel system that we are creating, it's pointless because the destination is the same. And to build partnerships is very important. I think this is something that we have realised. I think it's also down to the team being very purposeful in our visits to the Ministry of Education to want to partner with them. And I've, I'm very grateful that they have answered the call. Uh, they are actually willing to partner with us as well to speak to us, and that, that's a great start. No, I'm glad you're saying that because, you know, I, I now transcend the, the private Correct, education yeah. with, the pu with public education. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, you know, I'm constantly telling my colleagues back at UM that, you know, I feel like my role is to bring the best of um, Australian or international education system to... Um, you know, both the public and private side. So I am totally with you in terms of partnerships. I saw the negative effects of working in silo, particularly during COVID. And that's another, um, that's another session. But um, yeah, so, but maybe we should move on to... Let's, let's move on. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh. The, 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 um, the topic of our uh, chat today is reform, reset, and repurpose education for all. Sam, but I just want to ask you, um, in one word, what, what do you th how would you describe Malaysia's education system currently? I think when usually people ask me questions like this, it's really tough, right, to put everything into one word because it determines a lot of things. I took some time reflecting on it. I wanted it to represent uh, my time as an educator, my time in a non-profit as well, and my time in school, how I experienced it personally. It was really hard to do it in one word. Part. So I've got two words. It's the, I, I tried Shall my best, but I words? came up with two words. Uh, I think the first word is um, uh, potential. Uh, what is the word that I would like to use to describe our current relation education system, potential. I think if I can have, uh, by show of hands, how many of you went to public schools? Almost everyone went to public schools, right? And with the idea of potential, we have very high expectations, extremely high expectations, very rightfully so. We want our education system to be the best, not just in Asia, not just within the region, but ideally the best in the world. And if you look at the numbers, we, uh, the Malaysian education system, we invest a lot in our education. And, but why is it not up there? Um, let's look at some numbers. I picked up some numbers. Um, so, we have, whether, we have one of the best teacher-to-students ratios in Malaysia, actually, in public schools, comparative to other, other uh, uh, countries within the region. But we still have scholar daif. We still have schools yang tak the connectivity and accessibility. Recently, last year and this year, we had three Malaysian public schools that was named in the top 10 best schools in the world three Malaysian public school. But then at the same time, we also have issues recently, yang cikgu tidak hadir ke sekolah, dan sebagainya. We also, uh, I was talking to a friend yesterday that if I applied to be a teacher, into a teacher training college now, I probably would not get in. The standards are extremely high. Uh, the Ministry of Education, what they have done recently is to just make sure that the entry level for teacher trainees is actually at, I think, 8 A's, 9 A's, or 10 A's. I spoke to some IPG graduates, and you're like, straight A's, and you chose to be a teacher and all of that. Like, yeah, I only had about seven. So I was like, but, but there's always a but, right? But we see that teacher practices within the classroom does not prepare our students for jobs that do not exist in the years to come. So it's always like, there is something but it's not there yet. There are things that we are good at, but we could be so much more. And as a proud citizen of Malaysia, I believe that we should be aiming for the stars. We must be aiming for the stars. And that's the potential bit, Prof. Prof. As about relevance, uh, the second word that I have is relevant. 
how relevant is our current education ecosystem? Um, I picked up the numbers of enrollment into STEM education, for example. 2018, 44%. 2019, 43%. 2020, 47%. It's about the same, right? Summer is quite stagnant. But it could be so much more. 30,000 students did not sit for SPM last year. But the numbers are actually about the same for the past five years, actually. 49% or some of them, some, some data sources say 70 plus students, 70% 70, 70 plus students decide not to pursue the theory education. So, how relevant is our current? So, for me, these are the two points. These are the two words, Prof. What about you, Prof? And so, that's why my word choice, and we, we, didn't, we didn't practice this, huh? is actually transformation. In the higher education sector, it is crucial that we transform for all those reasons that you said, um, Sam. Um, and why do we need to transform? I think because the world has changed. Like it's, Everything is digital. And, and um, if we don't prepare our um, graduates for that world, they need to be not only digitally literate, but also data literate. But they also need to be human literate. I mean, hum because... You know, we, we can have everything digital, but if you don't have that human side, the social skills and all that. So all this needs to be built into new curric into curriculum of higher education. So if, if we don't transform our curriculum, then we, we're not going to be relevant to the job market, to the students, to the parents who are sending. So that's, that's number one. The transformation also needs to be in how we teach because young students now are not going to go and listen to lectures. At Monash, we don't give a single lecture. I, I walked in and all the lecture, lecture rooms have been boarded because it's very much active learning. And you know the, the, the teachers and the students have to prepare before coming to class, read up, and then it's all about interaction and, and question and answers and, and, and critical thinking and all of that. However, to support that learning means the teaching spaces have to be, um, have to, 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 to support that, to, to, to have interactive, you know, uh, boards and, and people able to beam from Australia and, and so forth. That all takes money, right? I feel very privileged being the, the president and pro vice chancellor of, of Monash Universities, Monash University, where the fees are, you know. But um, and and that brings me uh, later on. I'll I'll talk about my concern about about this private public divide and and the gap that's getting bigger and bigger. Um, so. So yeah, for me the word is, is transformation in terms of the content, in terms of the delivery, um, and um, it, it's got to be kind of, uh, yeah, adult active learning, um, and also lifelong, you know. Um, I think many people are now offering professional development um, uh, courses for, for lifelong because an and a few industry and, and businesses have come to us and say, can you teach us about net zero? Can you, can you teach us about you know, just transitions? Can, what does that mean? What, what, you know, how, do we, how do we equip people in Petronas to think about just transition? How, how do we equip? You know, so, so it doesn't stop at the, um, the undergraduate, master's, PhD level. It's got to be lifelong. And, and, and teaching adults is a completely different ball game than teaching your children. So, if higher educational institutions are not prepared to transform themselves, then they're going to be left behind. I'd just like to speak a bit on the uh, teaching quality uh, of how teachers, how, how does learning happen in our classrooms? I think I've, I've, rarely, I've rarely seen policymakers speak about this, that in order for us to start transforming our education system, we need to start talking about how our teachers teach and whether whatever they are teaching within the classroom is related to what's happening in the world. I was at a, a, a seminar the other day at AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, and they, they, one of the guys asked me, and he asked me a very relevant question. He said, um, Sam, how frequently do you use Google every day? And I was like, 
very frequent, right? You use it for almost everything. Now, you translate that to what happens in school. How many times a day does a child actually go online, searches for something, and start to do something about that? So there is a gap between what's happening and the way things happen in school to how it happens in real life. And that's why I speak about relevance. Relevance also depends on how the practices are happening within the classroom and how that relates to um, daily life. And, and I think that brings to a critical discussion around you know, the, the, the need to teach our young people critical thinking, right? I all went through, and many people in this room here went through, rote learning style of, you know, memorizing, even my medical students, the 10 causes of jaundice. So when, we, when I take them to the bedside and you've got this bright yellow patient, you ask them what's the, what's the cause of this person's jaundice, and they try and extract <gasps> cause number one is this, cause number two is this, cause number three is this, you know, from, from, their, from their REM. But... What we need to teach them is first principles, right? And, and that critical thinking. And I think, you know, there's a lot of debate in Malaysia over whether we should teach in Bahasa or teach in English. Actually, we're missing the point. We should be teaching whatever it is the best, the, in the best methods and to try and get students to think critically in English and in Malay. So for me, I think... It's the, the, the point should be we must teach Bahasa as well as we can, we must teach English as well as we can and should, and teach science and maths in the language as that, that, that for now, unfortunately, it looks like it's got to be Malay because more Malay, Malay students, um, they might not understand maths and science. English. But it's the method, it's the critical thinking, I think that's far, far more important. And, and the English and Malay should be given equal emphasis so because the if they're going to survive in this modern world right. where Google, right. you can get Google Translate, but it's going to take you a long time, right? So English is critical. Yeah. So I think the question is, how are we preparing for our teachers? Because, because you, you look at chat GPT. Chat yeah, that's GPT. your job. That's what you have chosen yes, to yes. do. So this is career. what we are doing at Pemimpin, right? To equip teachers. Because we think um, teacher professional development is a con teacher continuous professional development. Things change overnight very quickly. You had Ch ChatGPT 4.0 is coming out at the end of this year. I don't know how that's going to look like. I've got no idea what's going to happen next year with AI in, in all of that. But I think it is about us, how we can equip our teachers to quickly adapt to these changes, to quickly make sure that whatever that's happening with the classroom uh, is relevant. Um, I think this is something that the ministry needs to prioritize, that our government needs to prioritize. The allocation for teacher professional development is very, teacher continuous professional development is low. And we really need to prioritize on these matters. We compare to the likes of Singapore, Singapore actually spends about SED $7,200 uh, per year per teacher for their continuous professional development. And for us, it's actually so far behind in that sense. They've got their priorities right. Because I think you sow what you reap. You reap what you sow, sorry. Right? If we continually invest in making sure that our teachers are, are of high quality at all times, no matter how the system changes, our teachers are always at high quality. And they are able to adapt to that. But Sam, mm. the budget for 2023... Again, it's not... We, we, we didn't rehearse this. Right. I just did my own homework. Okay. I, I, the budget for um, Ministry of Higher Education and Ministry of Education was 55.2 billion for 2023 and 52.6 billion, of which 15.3 billion went to Ministry of Higher Education. So 40 billion went to... Ministry of Education. So where, where did that money go? I've got no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I, assume, I assume this is an assumption. I assume it's towards infrastructure. Uh, Which also needs upgrading. It is, it is. It definitely needs continuous upgrading and all of that. Uh, improving accessibility and connectivity and all of that, yeah. But I'm not really sure how they spent the entire budget of it. But I think if we really want to improve, if we really want to get ahead, if we really want to achieve that potential that we are talking about, we really want to be the best education system in the region, in the world, we need to invest in teachers. 
Absolutely. Now, what shall we talk about next, Sam? <laughs> since, since both of us are passionate about equality and, and, and you, you spend a lot of time with, with uh, Orang Asli, I'm now speaking, I, I feel a, a little ap apologetic that I'm speaking from privilege from a, an expensive private university. It's not that expensive, actually. We give a lot of scholarships <laughs> as well. We, we do, we do, give, we do give a lot of scholarships. Um, but, you know, my, my concern is this, this private-public divide, whether it's in primary school or, or in, in secondary school, and that's only going to increase the gap um, between the, the rich and the poor. And we know that there is a lot of relationship between poverty and education. Poverty, I mean, education uplifts people out of poverty, and, but poverty also is associated with poor educational attainment. So what are your thoughts on this, Sam, since you spend a lot of time with very, very underprivileged um, segments of society? I think for underprivileged communities, the, the math behind it is quite simple. Is it school or food on the table? So it's, it's, it's a very tough choice to make. And that is why I think sometimes it's a bit unfair to focus all the attention on the Ministry of Education because it's all interrelated. If they don't earn enough money, if the families don't earn enough money to sustain their livelihoods, why do you need to go to school? You might as well, I need you to get food on the table immediately. I need you to help my parents out doing something, you know, like for, for, for the communities that I work with, is to tend to the land or gather produce from the forest and all of that. So I think it's very interrelated. And that's how systemic changes happen. It's, it's not just the role of the Ministry of Education to make sure, of course, the Ministry of Education and to ensure that every public school in Malaysia provides high-quality education that is equitable for everyone. That is definitely it. But there are also other factors that contribute to lower academic performance. Nutrition, I think, is one of them. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously, my, my health background kind of makes me think about this all the time. But, you know, this is anecdotal, but you hear of uh, very, very poor families not feeding their children, you know, breast milk. And if they can't feed, if they can't give breast milk, then they're feeding condensed milk, you know, and, and, and things like that. And in those first thousand days of a child's life is really, really crucial. So um, that's why SDG 1 is removing poverty, right? And, and then everything else will, will follow. But unfortunately, I think the, the numbers of that you hear 70% don't want to go into higher education, I don't have the numbers, but I dare say quite a few would be from the B40s because they would rather quickly get their jobs and, and to put food on the table. So I, I guess at, at, at the end, it's addressing um, It is, uh, but it's, when we speak about also access to education, I think we can look back during the pandemic. During the pandemic, we had 1.8 million out of 6 million students who did not have access to online learning. That says a lot. Uh, technology, smartphones, and all of this is relatively quite cheap these days, but we still have that good 1.8 million out of that 6 million that cannot access education. Then we have learning poverty. Uh, the ability of a 10-year-old child to comprehend a simple paragraph. Malaysia did not do so well, unfortunately. Mainly, I would say it's mainly due to the pandemic and all of that, but we were ranked lower than the likes of Vietnam and Thailand. So there are areas of concern that we really need to uh, focus on. And I think in all... I really love to see a more sense of urgency towards issues like this. I think this is what, the gen for me personally, but I also think the general public wants to look at. If we have, we are talking about learning poverty, we are talking learning, about learning loss and all of that, we're talking about the digital divide, we're talking about AI, but where is that sense of urgency? To break again, going back to my two key words, right? Relevance and also potential. How are we, how, how are we really serious to bringing uh, the Malaysian education to reach that level? Which brings my question to you. What would you do if you were the Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> so how would you, how would you I evoke think, uh, that I sense of urgency? I spoke about this with someone yesterday and the person told me that, well, if you were Prime Minister, <laughs> I mean, because of your skin colour and all that, hopefully at that time already, Malaysia is already very well advanced in that sense. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if I were the Prime Minister, I think... Uh, for me, it's to make every public school in Malaysia 
reach global standards. And I think we have all it takes to do that. We have all the resources to achieve that, to achieve that level that we all so dream about, to ensure that quality education, yes, does not only depend on very fancy resources and all of that, but we need to set our priorities right, to ensure that every child in Malaysia like how every one of you, you're proud of your old school that you attended. I remember that teacher who changed my life. I remember that education system that I received back then. Every one of us should take pride in our education system and in our public schools and to bring it to global standards. So if I was Prime Minister and going to help you, the Minister of Education, achieve that, <laughs> what, what do you think I would do? I would leave politics out of school and higher education. That's what I would do. Fair point. So, Fair point. so the Prime Minister doesn't get to say that. He's just like, <laughs> take out politics and just go ahead with it. <laughs> no, it needs, it really needs to, you know, we all need to have that common vision that, mm. that, that Sam has and we need to leave education, I think, to the technocrats and let them do what's best for our children in preschool, in primary school, in higher education. Mm. I also believe that there needs to be more partnerships. I think that's what we, what I started off with. Um, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes everyone's involvement to uplift the education system in Malaysia. Everybody in this room has got a role to play, but we need to know what our roles are. Uh, and the Ministry of Education or the government, I think they need to start promoting this. We, are, we want to hear from different stakeholders. We want to hear from different experts of the field to come together with us to do this together. I think that's, that's the way forward. But also what's missing, I think, is your voices. You can't leave um, you know, it all to the, to the politicians. You can't leave it all to people in Mohi and Moi to, to do policies. You all, as parents and taxpayers, also have got to step up exactly. and demand yeah. a, a better education. No, no point, you know, like complaining on WhatsApp and, uh, you know, and writing to Malaysia Kini every now and again. You've <laughs> got to get involved. Um, you know, the best schools are the ones where the parents are involved. Exactly. Unfortunately, those best schools are where the parents are middle class and have time to, to spend going to, to parent-teachers meetings, not having to... A lot of my nurses have to do the nursing job during the day and, and bake cookies at night to make ends meet. So where got time to go for, for parent-teachers, right? So, but putting that aside, I think we've all got to stand up, be counted, and demand for the, the education system that, that we think the country deserves. Right. Um, and I say this because it not only affects your child, yourselves, your family, but it has a knock-on effect on almost everything. And, and to me, when I was a, the Dean of Medicine at UM, and I do exit interviews with doctors who want to leave into private practice. I say, oh, yeah, why you want to leave, you know? And they say, Prof Adiba, we love working here, but you don't pay me enough. Because I have to put my child through primary school, uh, through, sorry, through private school, and I have to think about their, their, their future. Um, how can you argue with that, right? Everybody wants the best for their child. So, that knock-on effect, and, and, and conversely, when, when I decided to send to, I mean, you know, because our parents all, there was, there was no question about sending me to a Is private it, yeah, school, exactly. even though that it was, right. or Kila, the policy then was mm. only for expatriates. Can. Right. But now, you know, National schools, public schools have become second choice, which is really, really sad because, like, all of you put your hands up, and, and that could be a matter of perception, and we're being unfair to a lot of, a lot of public schools and a lot of teachers and a lot of effort, but nevertheless, that's the perception. Um, and so it's something that we need to work against. But, you know, I think, yeah, the number one vision should be bring back the public schools that we all knew um, were, were the best. I, I, I come from Zainab Primary School in Kota Baru, okay? The best, private, the best public school. And I went there recently, um, actually to share some of my Merdeka Award with the, with the schools there. 
they don't even have a field. And I'm like, I remember the field that I used to have to raise a flag. You know, what happened to the field? And they said, Tadela, so what happens to PE? You know, and they said, oh, they just run on the tar. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's so sad, you know? So, so, so we've, we, as a nation, need to put our focus on bringing back those two essential public goods, education and health, to the highest standards that befits a country that is trying to be a developed nation. This, this public-private divide, mm, yeah. It's, 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 I mean, we were also speaking about not all private schools are the best schools, not all private hospitals are good as well, but I think it's that option. Uh, when we speak about schools in that sense, it's good that we have options these days. There's different types of schools as well. Schools that are more re religiously inclined, schools that are more entrepreneurial. I've seen some schools that are very hippie that says it's all about doing things that's very different. But you give people a choice. But ideally, for individuals that do not have that choice, they should be able to send their school, their children to a quality education system in public schools. Cho choice is one thing, mm. but are we sure that um, like, like you just yourself touch. Are, are all private schools equal? Are yep. all are all not. you know? So that's right. So this, whilst you you of course I'm all for choice, but standards they they have to be a minimum standard mm -hmm. for for all of this private school care, private university care, private hospital care. Right? Yeah. Okay. I think we've talked too much, Sam. Um, <laughs> question time. Yeah. Is it question time, Nadia? Nadia's missing. So anyway, the more, the more we talk, the more I yeah, I'll get into trouble. Question time, I suppose. Okay, so I now have questions. Hello. Please uh, raise your hand and we'll hand over the mic to you. Yes, over, over there, please, Aina. At the back there. Don't ask questions that are too curly because we don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> Stay here just so there's clear, clear vision. Hello? Okay, all right. Okay, hi, my name is Beth. So, as educators, I really want to ask you that in the days of digitalization, Nowadays, uh, more youth are more exposed to social media, and there is a, a growing increase minat uh, orang to be social media punya personality, online personality. So, as educators, how do you think we can pull them to be more interested in education and for them to pursue a career in education rather than just being uh, online personalities? Thank you. I think it goes back to what Sam was saying, that it's the onus is on us to make um, school relevant and interesting and exciting and, you know, um, and to instill that, that, that overall value and it's not just about looking pretty or making a lot of money to have the latest Chanel handbag or, or whatever, that there is more to life that, you know, that, that you know, they need to, to open their eyes to the big wide world of what can be done, what can be attained out there. And therefore, that onus is on us as educators, especially in the primary, at the, to sow that seed in, in, in the primary level. But not just educators, as parents as well. You know, um, to, to, to develop a, a child that's... that's um, has a broad view of the world, and not just about su success measured in terms of money and the latest cars or, 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 or handbag, yeah? For me, it's also about how teaching and learning is meaningful to students. I think back then, how it's meaningful is a bit different altogether. But if you're looking at creating TikTok videos and all of that, it's not straightforward, right? It's like 
production, you need to get the lighting right, you need to get this, you need to make sure that the wordings are there. But if we can incorporate these elements into classroom teaching and learning, that is where we get the students. Um, I, I think the Ministry of Education is uh, announcing a digital education policy soon, and I, I suppose it addresses matters like this. Like, how can teachers actually adapt what they are doing within the classroom to prepare students for the digital, digital age? Perhaps in 10, 20 years to come, uh, the best job in, in the world would be like a content creator or something like that, as opposed to, to being a professor or, or someone in the business. We don't know. And that is the challenge, to prepare students for a job ecosystem that may not, if we don't know how it's going to look like in the, in the coming years. So to make sure that every day what happens in the classroom is experiential, it's meaningful, it allows students to actually find, when you teach them things, when you allow them to be immersed in things that allows them to exercise their criticality, answering questions, solving problems. These skills take them very far. Oh, we've got three. <laughs> Hi, thanks for sharing. My name is Reza from Shell. So you guys were talking about the gap between private and public schools, yeah? And it's becoming a second option for national schools. But now in this age where we have so much knowledge uh, transfer, why is it that we can't transfer what we learn from private schools into national schools because the time that they spend in schools are the same, I would assume. Yeah, yeah so what's your thought on yeah, that? Yeah, great point. I think it, 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 it shouldn't be viewed as, a comp as competition. I think if you compare the best private schools in Malaysia, best international schools in Malaysia, there's a lot that our public schools can learn from. We need to figure out a way to how we are learning together and how we are partnering with them. It's not about like, oh, you guys doing it better, we have got our own way of doing it. I think it's, it's, we shouldn't be looking at it from that perspective. We should be learning from one another. S same with higher education. Um, it's, it's very structural and, and I've been fortunate to come from both worlds, right? And in fact, this morning I was discussing with the president of the Private Universities Association how it's so siloed. Um, it, yeah, and, and even attempts to bring, say, the two councils together uh, is, is usually met with resistance. So it's, it's, the, it's the mindset, unfortunately. Because there's a lot of things that, that can be shared. And, and I believe when Monash University was invited to come to Malaysia by the Malaysian government 25 years ago, it was exactly about that. It's about uplifting, you know, um, taking the best from, from Australia. Not everything they do is good, but, you know, taking the best of... of, of, of what they can offer and uh, benchmarking it. I, I'm only two and a half months at Monash University in Malaysia. I will do my best, uh, at least through research and working together with colleagues at UM. I hope some of that um, will take place. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for bringing up the question or the topic of class divide in the education system. I think we also have the issue of um, racial divide, but we're not you with uh, a more dangerous question that goes along the line of um, can we or should we or how do we change the system because that's a more complex topic. Uh, but I guess a more practical question is how do we, or this is a question that maybe Mr. Sam could answer, um, in an education classroom or a school so monoculture where everyone looks the same as each other, everyone thinks the same way, has the same lifestyle, practices the same religion, um, when you enter those spaces and you engage with those students and try to teach them, how do you promote them to think outside of binaries or to think outside of, um, you know, to promote more critical thinking and get them to be ready for the real world that is a lot more diverse? So this is a question coming from someone who spent five years in an all-girls Islamic Malay school. So um, it took me a while to kind of be ready for the real world where not everyone is the same. So um, how do you, as a teacher, um, break the consequences of monoculture? For me, I'm uh, also happy to answer that. Right, sure. I think um, I, the, the school that I went to had a small minority group, but mostly Malays as well. And, but when I was sent to school, it was basically monoculture. Every child in my, my classroom was orang asli chakun. So I saw that, that, was, that, that that's the, uh, because of the lack of exposure, 
They don't know much about what's happening on the outside. They don't know much about, and that is why when we look at the purpose of an education system altogether, back in the day, it was about unity. I think this is something that's making, uh, coming back again. If you look at the uh, National Education Blueprint, unity is actually one of the big part of it, so that we understand the expectation. We understand how to be tolerant and all of that. What I did with my students was just to bring them out was just to do a lot of exchanges. And I think with a world where you can just connect with someone over Zoom and online almost immediately, this cultural exchanges is extremely important. It's not so much about what are we learning from their practices and all of that. It's just to get to know that the world is a wider space, to appreciate that there are differences and differences are good. Differences make us better, to be able to be respectful of our differences altogether. But this also requires, uh, let's say, going back to the idea of how a teacher adapts to these, these needs. And I think teachers in Malaysia right now are trained to ensure that whatever that they do encourages unity, encourages students to explore different identities in Malaysia. So, at, when, when, when I was a dean of medical school at UM, it bothered me that the, you know, the Chinese students sit on one side of the classroom, the Indian students sit on the back side of the classroom, and it's very cliched and very stereotypical, but unfortunately that's how it is, and the Malay girls will sit on, in this right side of the classroom. So first of all, I think it really, the, the school, the government, everybody needs to be aware that you can't, we can't continue like this, especially in a medical school where, you know, when, when they go out there as doctors, they're going to have to treat someone regardless of race or religion, right? And, and, and on top of that, cultural practices have impact on how they present or how they not present or, you know, whether they go to Seise or whether they go to um, Malay Bomo or whether they go to an Indian shaman. You know, all that can, can impact their um, health and, and outcomes, right? So it's critical that at least medical students at UM and now at, at Monash understand that. And they're not going to understand that sitting together in, in clusters like that. So I introduced a class when I was the Dean of Medicine called Multicultural Competency. And I would mix them. I would get them to come to the front of the class and say, what do you know about Chinese traditional medicine? I can, I can tell you, a lot of the Malay students had no idea, you know, about, about, Chinese, about TCM, or about cupping, or about, you know, uh, and, and, the Malay and the Chinese students also had no idea about BOMOs, you know, or at least some details about it. And, and the pantangs, you know, the, the, the Chinese pantangs are very different from the Malay pantangs, from the Indian pantangs, right? But we all have pantangs. So, so you have to do, you can't leave it to chance. You actually have to have um, classes to break this. So that's, that's in actually introducing um, syllabus around this. But also in terms of their interactions, we would ensure that groups, small group tutorials are mixed, you know, and the students can't just elect to go all Malay groups or all Chinese group or all Indian groups. We, you know, we actually have to be quite deliberate about it. So, but that means an awareness at the high level of the need for this, you know, um, and unfortunately there are some people who are just happy to perpetuate this. And it's not healthy, it's not healthy for anyone. Least of all, it's not healthy for the patients when you end up as a patient. Um, or when, when you're a doctor and you, you have to treat someone and you're not familiar with the different pantang larangs. So it's, it's got to be deliberate. It's got to be almost at a policy level. Because we're so, so divided now. Right? There are people who are sitting next to each other. And I said, have you ever been, to, you know, if, if they come like, like, for yourself, you were in a mono monocultural school. Some of them don't even have friends from other cultures. So, and let's not talk about, you know, gender uh, issues, which I also, you know, we also introduce uh, classes around that um, because you can't be doctors if you don't respect gender diversity, right?
Good evening to all. My name is Mr. Satya. I'm a PPD officer from the Ministry of Education. Well, uh, the reason I drove all the way 100 kilometers from Podixon to here is because look at the title, Reform, Reset, Repurpose, Education for All. Well, um, look at the, it, is, it was a very good uh, discussion as we are gathered here, all the intellectuals here. Now, <clears throat> um, my question, it's not a question, maybe it's a, it's a discussion. See, when we compare 30 years ago, when we ask one question to a, to a student, primary student, what is your ambition? Either <clears throat> he or she will say, I want to become a doctor or a lawyer. Either white gown or a black gown. There is no any other choice. So now when we ask the same question after 30 years, now people will say, I want to do robotics. I want to involve in technical and vocational studies. Even I personally, I'm a former teacher. I asked some students, they say, uh, after SPM, I just want to work. Who scored 10 A's in SPM? She is telling me, saying that I just want to work, earn my own money. I want to set up my own bakery and all these things. Now, uh, Hello. Yeah, professor. <laughs> uh, so you are sitting on the tertiary side of education. You are on the primary and secondary part. Now, my question is, the government is spending quite, quite a huge number of money on TVET, technical and vocational. Uh, how we are planting this uh, Sorry. See, what we are uh, planting at the primary level, we are going to ripe at the tertiary level. Some students who did their MBBS at University of Malaya, they quit their MBBS studies and they want to do ICTs. They want to become business people. So how we are going to do that at the primary level? We are sitting here at the 42nd floor in KLCC. We are talking about this. And let's look at the students who are, who are staying far away in Sarawak, who are, who are still studying at, uh, at uh, estates, are they still performing? That's my, my question. Second question is, until now there are students who are coming to school for the sake of one meal. We do have some numbers, just for the sake of one meal. So when we talk about the quality of teachers, when the selection process, when you're going to select, it is not the matter of how, what they score for their SPM. Do they have the real quality of teaching? Adakah mereka mempunyai naluri keguruan itu? That's what we are need to highlight on that. Maybe Chigu Sam, you can you can say about that because you involved in the Sekolah Orang Asli and all these things. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's probably three questions there. I'll, I'll take the last one first in teacher selection. I think, of course, academic qualifications is one of the determiners that we hey, determine hey, whether hey, this teacher, hey, hey, this individual hey, has got the capabilities uh, to deliver um, uh, and to teach students, of course. But yes, I do agree with you. Um, there should be an emphasis on what makes a teacher a good teacher, whether this individual is passionate for the job. I always speak about this, that the teaching profession on its own, it's quite different as compared to other professions. It's a combination of very high skills. We need individuals with very high skills because like whatever that we've been talking about, is are they able to adapt to changes? And to do that, you need to be smart. To change different techniques for different students, to come up with contextualized solutions for different communities, you need high skills, high intellect to do that. But at the same time, the role of a teacher is not just about delivering a subject or delivering a content. It's about touching lives. It's about changing lives. A teacher can, can make or break you. That's, that's often being said. So to be able to choose individuals like that, I think we really need to look at our teacher selection process altogether. But that is made with the assumption that the teacher selection process in Malaysia has got issues with it. Of course, uh, we must have more conversations with Bagian Pendidikan Guru, for example, to see how do they determine an individual to be an excellent teacher or before they become a teacher itself. And then I also think we need to look at teacher education. How relevant is the syllabus within teacher education? Has it been stagnant? Is it, been ch is it changing? Is it relevant to, 
to what we need right now, I think these are the questions that we need to ask about. But I do agree with you. We should not be selecting teachers based on their academic qualifications alone. There are a lot of other factors that contribute or that make a teacher a great teacher. That's what we need to look for. And I completely agree with you that we have to go back to basics. And, and that's why we, we, we also discussed about poverty, right? I mean, you've got to address that, that root cause and, um, of, of addressing poverty. Um, if, you're, if your stomach is empty, you, you're not going to... It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, and you're not going to worry about algebra, right? Um, so, yes, so the, there's a lot of things that, that we need to do, and I think TVET is good. You know, because not everybody wants to be a doctor or wants or, or have the right, you know, um, capabilities to be a, a, an engineer, a robotics engineer, um, a, a, a lawyer, a doctor, or whatever. And, you know, hey, in, in, in the UK, in Australia, the plumbers and the, the, the guy who comes and fix your electricity earn more than a doctor on an hour basis. So, um, but... You know, there's proper training, proper accreditation, proper um, for for all of those um, semi-skilled jobs, right? So, horses for courses. There's, there's. I think you know, um, there's some people who who, who are going to be very good at this this um, t technical job. Some people we need lots of people who are going to be teachers and lawyers and academics. But well, the point is, the education system need to allow for this choice at the highest quality. You know, it doesn't mean that TVET is, you know, second class, you know. So, so that, I think, uh, is the challenge. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, I guess it's not so much of a question, but I would just like to acknowledge um, Thank you for bringing up the topic about having a teaching space that support teaching and learning. So that's definitely something that I'm doing. My name is um, I am a Yeah, you're very few and far between. Uh, there are very few of you, right? Learning space designer and curriculum yes. <laughs> design. You know, the, what do, you, do they call this? Um, the, the, those who are you know, very adept at using um, the environment digital, the, digital yes. uh, for, mm. for le as learning design. They, they're mm. very, very scarce. That's, that's another job um, to do. In Much for bringing it up, um, because being a learning space designer myself, I'm also an educator who are um, mostly underprivileged communities. It really definitely picked me to the differences that we can see between public and private schools. So when I just I really feel like everything that was talked about is something that really resonates well with me. So really, thank you so much for bringing it up. I really want this kind of conversation to go further. So I'm also taking this opportunity to also let people know, if ever, that you have schools, you know schools that are thinking of redesigning space. They are public schools, definitely, uh, high need schools especially. Um, I'm offering myself, my expertise, um, to have conversations because I'm, I'm also the, currently the only Malaysian in the Learning Environment Association. So I, don't want, I do not want to continue being alone, so definitely um, let me know um, if you would like to have a conversation with your teachers, with your students, in order to have a purposeful uh, redesigning of your learning spaces. So yeah, thank you. Thank That's you so fantastic much. because it's also not necessarily just about money, is it? Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> I think you need you need someone who with the know-how to yeah. redesign a classroom, and it's not always about the most really, the, the really, latest yeah. high definition whiteboards. Although yes. we have that, but you know, it's not always uh, uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, it's not always about the money. People always thinking about it's about the money, but it's definitely not the money because it's about digital age. How are you going to uh, install, for example, a, a high-tech high paneria, all this? You want to do this when so you have to be very purposeful of your redesigning. You really have to speak to your users because as much as architects and designers are more teachers, teachers are also more designers. So you have to speak to Fantastic, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great for offering your services. Thank you. Thank you. 
relevant and being potential, being transformation. But what I'm curious to know here is that, do you think that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, financial difficulties or the, the money is not the, the money is not only the core problem, right? <laughs> so, but but what is the what is the initiative have you been taking as an educator? to make sure that, uh, you know, and as an educator, we are not only looking at financial difficulties, we want to be able to close all the gaps. So do you think the poverty of an, any individual is not the only cause? Or do you think that uh, highly, uh, highly financial um, institution or education institution are monetizing the education, which is heavily burdened on people who are B40 or probably lesser than that? So I understand that, yeah, Ola, you tablet that you need that much of uh, funded uh, financial uh, assistance, but but I think uh, being so ridiculous in monetizing education, uh, making sh making uh, people feel so difficult of observing the education in all means. You got what I mean? Because it's education is for all. So if every every sector gotta be monetizing, but you gotta be a little. Is you, you need to know the well-being of people and how do you balance with the financial and the means of education that you're providing to people. So what is your thoughts? I mean, any of you, any of you can answer the question, but uh, it's, it's a kind of a burning question in me for such a long time that do you think money is the, uh, it, it's based on people or do you think the financial institution will need to take a look at it? I think if I understand your question correctly, um, what, what, you know, the, the problems that we're facing now is partly because um, education and brackets health um, have been so privatized, right, that we now have this private-public divide that, you know, despite the, the billions that's been poured into education, we're still struggling with um, at least perceived quality of the public education system. So... So it's one thing; it's money, um, and and the other. I mean, it's it's it's. I don't know. It's so it's so complex. Um, the the perception is real, though, that that parents are voting with their feet, and sending their children to private, school. private schools. So I think the challenge for the government, for Mohi, Mohi, all of us, is to how to make the public institutions, whether, whether primary, secondary, or, 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 or universities, the university of choice. I mean, the, the, the institution of choice rather than, than private. But I'm usually very, very optimistic. But um, Sam still is because he... he <laughs> I he, am, I am. He, he, I think, I think, I think <laughs> you know, but sorry, sorry, one, one thing. Sure. But in, in a way, just like in, in, in private, in, in health, in some ways, the horse has already bolted, and to bring it back is going to take enormous political will, um, because there are so many, many invested stakeholders in the game, whether it's, and, and very, very powerful stakeholders in the game, whether it's schools or universities or health. So the challenge for us all is, how do we demand that? You know, especially for, for, for you younger parents, how, how do you demand that quality education for your children that's affordable, right? Um, and, and bring back public education. I'm still a bit, I'm not a bit, I am very optimistic. I think uh, uh, for, Mal for, for Malaysian education system, like what Prof mentioned, and what we've been conversing about is to make sure that public schools are the number one choice and they are of highest quality. That's the only way we can ensure that no matter whether you have money, if you have money, you can make the choice, you can have the But if you don't have money and you don't have resources, it's not a second class option. It is still high quality education. And how do we get there? I think some of the things that we've been talking about is improving teacher quality. That's something that we really need to talk about because as much as policies change, ministers change and all of that, at least our teachers are the best. We need to ensure that we continuously invest in them. And these and every other thing, I think if, if you're looking for one solution, 
It doesn't exist. There's multiple solutions. It's a complex problem. We talked about poverty as well. Those are the things that it's beyond the reach of the Ministry of Education, for example. They can do Makanan RMT and all of that, but besides that, it needs everyone to play their part. And that is why, like what she mentioned earlier, partnerships is very important. If there is a lack of capacity within the government or there's a lack of expertise within the government, they should be able to reach out to us and come together so that we can all do this together for Malaysian education system. And that is the ultimate aim. That is something that we all need to work. If not, we have lost the plot. Yeah, and I think that, that invoking that sense of urgency that, Correct. you know, and you touched on this earlier, Sam, that, that hey, you know, the, 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 the ship is kind of going that way when it should go that way and mm. up and up mm. and up, right? Um, and, and, and that has to come from all of us. We can't right. just leave it to the politicians. We've got to demand that, you know, for the future of this country, for the future of our children, for the future of this country, we want the best education, right? We want the best public education. We want the best... Sorry, I keep going back to health because without health, you, 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 you can't have all these things either. So we, we need to demand that, the best public education and the best public health that the country can afford. And my God, we're here. The country can afford this. Can afford this. It's how we prioritize. Correct. Right? Hi, um, I'm Yuan Mei Wong. I just completed Hello? a project on safe and fair uh, labor migration for women migrant workers in Malaysia under uh, EU sponsorship. So um, I would like to uh, raise one issue is about pedagogy and about the function of education. I think in the context of education as an upward mobility tool, but it is also a tool for social justice. That is uh, international labor organization's uh, approach. So with that, uh, one sharing is that what uh, under the project, what we do is we engage uh, uh, domestic workers in Malaysia who are actually in, in the informal industry, but bringing them into campuses, private and public campuses, especially to the law students. So I think education have to provide still the window to the world have to provide channels for students to understand and connect to the society so if social justice is the principle one of the uh, marginalized community in malaysia is the women migrant workers who take up domestic work in the country so with that uh, principle and and the methodology that they use is called town hall sessions so they organize town hall sessions on campuses and then uh, law students will come and listen and engage conversations with domestic workers. If that is one possible pedagogy, then uh, hopefully pi public and private uh, university and primary school and secondary school can open up the space for more this kind of initiative and to overcome the issue of language translation actually is one of the because domestic workers in Malaysia, they are Filipino and Indonesian, so language is a barrier, but we bring in, trans, uh, in uh, translation. Perhaps this can also uh, uh, sure. use it for indigenous people, as well as like some Chinese fisher folks, mm. uh, some Malay uh, yeah. farmers yeah. in the rural areas to speak to the students. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you for bringing that, because I think um, that is one area we haven't talked about this afternoon, which is education for all. There are many thousands of children, refugee children and migrant children who are not in school in, in Malaysia. And um, we'll have to get Madeka Award to invite us for another day for this, uh, yeah. <laughs> for this session. Um, yeah, but, but health for all. I mean, <laughs> health. Education, education for, for all. all. Uh, sorry, education <laughs> for all, but health for all as well. Yeah. So you, you touch on... A very important topic, yes. So, so, yeah, Sam and I, Sam and I you know, we, we work with marginalised communities, yeah. so it, it's, thank you for bringing that up, yeah. Okay, one last question from, from the back. Sheila, oh. go ahead. Hear me? Um, okay, um, I'll pass it on to Dino afterwards. He was actually the brainchild for this. Um, my question is this. 
Prof, you've worked in health and you've seen changes in your, um, in your tenure um, with regards to AIDS, right? It was a very present uh, issue that the country needed to face and over time, the policies helped to reverse some of the, um, well, not just reverse, but I, I think vaccines were then available to more people. Um, and with that, with access, with education, we were able to then reverse the, or to stymie the, the growth of HIV AIDS in the country. And I think you've taken this best practice globally. Um, my, my question is really about some best practices that we can take from that for education. And also, um, to give us a sense of how urgent this is, because sometimes I think uh, we talk about it being urgent in WhatsApp groups, but we've had, the country has suffered severe learning loss during the pandemic. Millions of children were affected, right? What will it take and how soon can we expect to see change? Okay, I, I just came back from the International AIDS Conference in Brisbane uh, last week and Australia, uh, quite apart from what we've done in Malaysia, is Australia is probably going to be the first country to virtually eliminate HIV. And there's a few countries in Africa, it's Watini, formerly Swaziland, and you know, all these countries poorer than us, uh, achieving the 95, 95, 95 goals, which is treatment goals and um, undetectable viral load. But Australia will, will probably reach um, the virtual elimination. And so what's their recipe? Number one, political will. Bipartisan political will. From the very first time that HIV emerged in Australia, it was bipartisan. Whether it's a Labour government or the Liberal government, they all had the same goals, right? And they worked together and political will at the highest level. Number two, going back to what you're saying, the importance of partnership. The scientific community, the academic community, the clinical community, the, the affected community, the gay and bisexual men and, and, and people who use drugs all came together to work together crafting programs, whether it's prevention or treatment. Number three, things, programs are based on evidence. It's not based on sapa sapa punya suka. You know, it's evidence and evaluated. Um, craft programs based on the best available evidence locally or globally or whatever. Implement, evaluate, 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 and you know, change course if you need to based on your evaluation. Number four is, of course, adequately resourced, finance, right? But if the government puts its mind to it to do all these things, and those are the necessarily elements, whether it's education, whether it's HIV AIDS, whether it's environment, you know, bipartisanship, political will, working together, adequately finance, evidence-based, implement, evaluate, change course if it's not working. One of the things we don't do very well in these countries is that evidence, many things we can improve, but that evidence-based policy and evaluation of our policy. That's why we spend so much money and we don't know where it's gone to. I just asked Sam, where did the 56 billion go to, Sam? You say, I don't know. Um, so because we don't evaluate, right? So I think that's a stock answer for, for anything that you right. want to do well. Okay, one last question. No, I agree completely. <laughs> I think that, that is the premise of what we've been speaking on it, it's, itself and um, just to the first few points that Prof was talking about, I think it definitely needs political will. We can go on talking about this over and over again in every other forum about education reform, education changes, but it requires political will. And like she mentioned, bipartisan political will. Because things like healthcare, things like education, it's beyond. It's not, I think we also need to start removing egos, like people want to claim, oh, this is my program, this is what I implemented and all of that. I think that should be out of the window altogether. If it's for the betterment of society, we should put those differences, we must put those differences aside for us to see anything significant to happen. Hi, uh, hi, Prof. Aniba. Hi, Sikhu Sam. Dino here. Hi. Uh, question is very, very simple. 
from a management perspective, from a cikgu perspective, do you believe teachers are being incentivized enough? Um, I, I'm not talking about money per se here. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, exactly. That's why the question is pertinent. Because, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about money per se. I mean, heavens, we can't quite even decide on what is a feasible minimum pay for people, or we can't quite decide if interns should be paid to begin with. Um, but I'm talking about incentivizing uh, as a whole money, um, work life balance, time off of family, opportunities. Um, do we actually have to wait for the oldest teacher in the school to retire before we get promoted? Ditto for um, you know, lecturers. Um, you, know, you said just now you need to have uh, good quality teachers, right? But who's going to do work if they're going to get enough? You know, if I'm laying it out very, very plainly here. So, from your individual perspectives, are we doing enough so that the educators are incentivized enough to do their best? Thank you for the question. I think from the salary perspective, it is enough. But it's very much related to the workload of what teachers are expected to do. Sometimes we create ridiculous expectations for teachers and expect everything to be solved in schools. It's like schools is the ground where you need to solve every problem in society. And I think we need to move away from that. With regards to, I think the Ministry of Education realizes this, that there's always talking about beban tugas guru or teacher workload. How do we make sure that teachers are focusing on what they are trained to do, which is teaching? And a lot of teachers often feel that they are They've been deviating away from what they are passionate to do. What they really, really want to do is just work with kids, teach them, and then just enjoy the entire process altogether. So I think the money, uh, the salary that's been given to teachers is enough. It can be better, of course, based on inflation and all of that, yes. But it's enough if teachers are expected to only do teaching. But sometimes we speak about schools like are there certain teachers, they have to buy books for kids, resources, colour pencils and all of that, decorate the class and all of that. Perhaps these are areas that we need to consider, but I think we need to look at the teacher workload. And this also relates a lot to teacher motivation. How are we making sure that our best teachers stay and how are we making sure that we attract the best people into the teaching profession? And it all comes to this, to ensure that they teach. Uh, this is a problem, not just in Malaysia, it's also in the United States as well, in other countries as well. How do you make sure that teachers are motivated, they are best incentivized and all of that. But I think the simple solution to that, it's simple when I'm saying it, but I think to achieve it is quite hard, but it's to ensure that they do what they love best, which is teaching. And in, in a sense, um, Dino, you kind of answer your own question because it's, it's also not just about money and, and particularly in higher education, I think the opportunity for their own personal yeah, growth, personal growth you know, yeah, um, growth. And, and opportunities mm. to advance their career in, in, in different ways. And I know Abi is sitting at the back there, but this is a plug for Monash University. One of the things I learned um, that Monash has, and I, I was really quite astounded because um, they have this, this thing for they've identified like excellent researcher teachers and, and these are people even at professor levels are given training and, and mixed with you know a pool of other people from, from Malaysia, from Australia, from, from um, other campuses to nurture leadership for, for example and, and this you know like I said it's even at the at those who have already got their professorship but that's how much you know that constant learning and, and, and value of, of talent um, and all that is seen at my current university as being very, very important. So, so um, providing all these opportun opportunities other than just you know, their, their monthly salary is hugely important to attract talent, retain Every talent um, and grow talent. Hello. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much, Sam. I think that's been a lengthy discussion, but we can still continue on the discussion during refreshments. Once again, on behalf of the Medina Trust, I would like to thank Prof. Hadiba as well as Sam for being here with us today. Can we have a round of applause for them, please? All right. So um, with that, uh, I would like to thank all of you as well for making time to, sp to come here all the way to KLCC and you know, to listen into our talk series. Do stay tuned for the second part of the Medeka talk series which will be sometime in October, all right?
Thank you so much again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.